So, good morning everyone, and uh, I thank you again very much for coming out today. Uh, today we conclude our series. Uh, we're looking at the book of Job as our opening verse, uh, Job chapter 13, verse 9. And in that verse, uh, Job is asking a question, God's asking a question. He's asking that if, if uh, God was to examine us, uh, how would it turn out? Would it turn out well if God examined you, examined me? Uh, and we said the word examine means to test. The word test means to, to give some kind of proving, uh, to, to prove something, to put, put some pressure, to put something through a, a tedious uh, test, to, to prove out, to examine uh, that particular area in, which is, in what's being examined. And, uh, and so if we put that word examined with the word test, uh, basically God is asking us, you know, when God does examine us, What's the result? What, what happens in our lives? What happens in our spiritual lives uh, when God tests us, when God brings us through a test? And, and obviously, as we've been talking, there are two responses. Uh, one response is it drives us uh, away from God. It, it puts a wedge in there. We're, uh, we're distraught. We're, you know, maybe we're not liking the test so well. Maybe, maybe the test is more than we can bear. It's, it's overwhelming. It's just it's, – it's not – it's, it's – um, we can't understand it. It's, it's beyond comprehension. And so maybe maybe it's putting a, a little bit of a wedge in there. It's separating us from God a little bit. Um, it can also drive us closer to God. And that's what we're going to see today. Uh, today, that is where God wants us to be whenever he brings us through a test. Uh, he wants us to come to him, to, to be drawn closer to him, to abide in him. As the book of James tells us to abide in him and he will abide in us. And, uh, and so again, we've been talking about what does God prove or, or what does God test in our lives. Uh, first of all, he tests our faith. Uh, he tests to see if our faith, uh, to prove our faith, our faith is genuine. Is it, is, it, uh, is it strong? Is it real? The second thing he tests is our heart. Is our heart fully committed, fully devoted to the Lord? Is our heart dedicated to God? That's what our lesson was about last Sunday. Um, and so we're looking at that word tested. And that is exactly, uh, as we conclude our lesson, that's exactly what we've been talking about is, is these various tests that God allows us to go through because Satan, because a lot, God does allow Satan to test us. Uh, it's also the hand of God himself uh, testing us. But last Sunday we talked about the word piety. And again, it's a word that we don't hear often. It's a word that we usually don't use in common everyday language as we talk to one another. But piety means uh, uncompromised loyalty, meaning that your, your loyalty to something, in this case, our loyalty in our relationship with God, our loyalty to God, our loyalty to God's word, it is uncompromised. We're not willing to bend. Basically, And so we talked last week, we, we talked about Enoch and Noah and David, and we saw that they had a, they, they walked with God, they had a very uh, close, steadfast relationship with God, and that's the word steadfast that I really wanted to focus on last Sunday. Uh, and we looked at Daniel, and Daniel certainly had a, a steadfast relationship with God because God was allowing him to go through a test. Daniel being a Hebrew... Approximately 17 years old, he was taken into captivity in Babylon, and obviously uh, we know through the lesson last Sunday, we looked at two different types of lessons last Sunday with Daniel, we know that Daniel walked with God. He had that, that strong, that close, steadfast relationship with God. Not only did he have a relationship with God, he also upheld the Jewish law, the, the Torah, uh, the, the first five books of the Bible. Um, and so we asked the question again, what was Daniel's test? And, and there were a couple. Um, the first test was, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar had hand-selected him to serve under the king as a dignitary, to, to be a dignitary to the king. We don't know what kind of position, but we do know that he was hand-selected by King Nebuchadnezzar himself and said, Daniel, I'm choosing you, as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All three of those boys were also chosen. But there were some stipulations uh, for, for Daniel and, and the three boys as well. They had to learn the Babylonian customs. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't be a dignitary in the land of Babylon if you did not know the Babylonian customs. <laughs> just, as, just as you cannot be a dignitary in the United States if you didn't know the United States customs or any other country for that matter. And also, the big one was that he had to eat the Babylonian food. What, what the Babylonians ate, what the king ate, he was supposed to partake of it as well. It's supposed to be his diet as well. 
And obviously the Babylonian food, it, it was inappropriate for the, for the Jews to eat. It, it was against the Jews' law. They were not allowed to eat that kind of food. And if they did eat it, they were breaking God's law. They were breaking the Jewish law. And so in essence, they were being disobedient against God. And so the question was, you know, okay, well, Daniel's being asked to eat the, the Babylonian food, the food that's against God and his word. And so what did that test do? Did it drive him to God or did it drive him away from God? And obviously we saw last week that he didn't eat the food. He, he held to his confection, to his, um, yeah, his, his convictions. He held to his moral convictions. He held to the world of God, to the word of God. Uh, he, his, his relationship with God was steadfast, that it was, it was unconditional loyalty. So he was unconditionally loyal to God and God's word. And so he refused to eat the Babylonian food. Now the second thing we saw last, uh, the last week was. There were some men that, that did not like David or Daniel excuse me, very well. Uh, they hated him. And so they set a trap for him. They, know that they knew that Daniel prayed every day. He, actually three times a day. Daniel would go back to his room. Back to his quarters. And he would pray. And so they knew that he was, he was a doubt. He, they knew he was a follower of God. And so uh, they thought well we're going to catch him in his own trap. And so what they did is they went to, to King Darius, the Persian king. Uh, the Persians had taken over the Babylonian Empire. Uh, the Babylonians were no longer in power. The Persians now were in power. The Jews were still there in Babylon, but they were under a new, a, a new king, under the Persian king. And so these men decided, let's go to King Darius and ask him or suggest him a new law. And the law was that the people could not seek counsel from a god or God, capital G-O-D, uh, unless... Without, without consulting or, uh, or seeking the advice of the king. They had to come to the king basically first. They weren't allowed to go to God. They weren't allowed to pray to God. They weren't allowed to seek God. Uh, they were only to seek the king and his advisement. And so again, uh, what would be the result of that? Okay, obviously, you know, Daniel's a prayer. Daniel has a steadfast relationship with God. He prays. Three times a day he prays. And now he knows that this law has been signed. He is not allowed to pray. If he's praying, if, he find, if he's found praying, he's going to be thrown in the lion's den. And obviously the lions would then be hungry to, to devour him. But anyway, again, we saw that the test, uh, it drove him to God. Because, uh, again, he would not compromise his beliefs. His, his relationship with God was, was uncompromised. His relationship with God was steadfast. He was... He was unconditionally loyal to God and God's word. And so he went back to his quarters, back to his room. Even though he knew the law had been signed, King Darius had signed it, he did, it didn't matter. He was going back to his room and he was going to get down on his knees and pray again. So he prayed just like he did every other day. Every, I should say every day. And so again, the, qu the question for us, the test for us is, do we hold fast to our beliefs? Do we hold true to our moral convictions? Do we, have, do we hold God's word in our heart? Uh, do we have an uncompromised, steadfast relationship with God? And so the two things that we talked about last Sunday are, are kind of the same two things that we are tested with. Maybe we're getting, maybe we're getting a promotion. Maybe we're looking forward to something occurring in our lives. Uh, maybe something, maybe, maybe uh, there's, a, there's a chance of a lifetime coming up. Maybe it's a vacation of a lifetime. But in order, to, in order to ascertain that, in order to have that, you have to bend the rules a little bit. And so are we willing to bend the rules just to get what we want? Just to get that long-awaited promotion, that long-awaited vacation, that long-awaited whatever it may be. Are we willing to bend the rules to get it? And then uh, the last one was, of course, then was the laws. Uh, Darius had passed that law of the land. And so, again, our, when, when the law is passed, when the law of the United States is passed, when the president makes a new law and he signs it into, into, into effect, does that new law, it may, be, it, may, it may not be supportive of our Christian beliefs, of our Christian faith. And so what does that do? Are we willing to allow the law of the land to change our conviction, to change our moral our moral standard, our uh, uh, um, our closeness of, with God and our closeness with his word. And so again, um, looking at Daniel again, uh, so when those kind of things happen in our lives, are we willing to, do, are we driven from God or are we driven closer to the Lord when those kinds of tests happen in our lives? All right, as I mentioned, uh, today is our, is our last uh, Sunday for our study this this series. We're going to start in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. Today, 
we're not going to focus on the test itself, um, you know, testing of our faith, testing of our heart. We did several lessons on testing our faith. We did several lessons on testing our heart. Today, I really want to encourage us because I know every one of us is going through a test right now. I know every one of us is going through a test right now. Everyone is going through a test right now. <coughs> look, look, look the situation of America. That should be a test for us. That should be a testimony, uh, a testimony of a test for us of what's happening in our world today. So I, I don't know if it's bothering you. I'm hoping it's bothering you because it's certainly bothering me, and so it's, it, it is a test for me. Uh, and so today I, I really want to I want to encourage us today. I want to encourage myself. I want to encourage you through the Word of God today that when we are tested. All right, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, it says, In this you rejoice. Now listen to what Peter says. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Okay, do you hear what, what Peter said? He says, even though, even though we're going through some testing, there's a reason to rejoice. There's a reason to rejoice even though we're going through a time of testing. Now, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes through that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, Peter tells us that we will all we have already and as I mentioned, we probably currently are are, are even though I should say are still going through tests. We are going through we we went through numerous tests we have more tests to come, and I'm, I'm saying again that we are all involved in the test right now. Now, each of those tests, they vary in intens intensity. Uh, some of them are mild. Some of them are not as bad as others. Some of them are very severe, and then I use the word atomic. Some of them are atomics. They're atomic bombs. They're just, they're just like, wow, I, can't, I cannot deal with this. And I know many of us today are going through atomic bombs. I know. <clears throat> now... They're also, they also vary in, in length or duration. Some are very short, some are long, and some are quite extensive. Uh, not only are they quite extensive, but they're also the atomic ones, the ones that seem to go on forever and ever and ever. There's no end to it. Now, now also with these tests, they vary in effect. Some of them affect our body, illness. Some of them affect our mind, confusion, uncertainty, worry, fear. Some of them affect our spouse. Our spouse is going through a test, or we're going through a, a trial with our spouse, and that's a, that's a test. Some of them are, are maybe through our children, with our grandchildren. Our, 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 there's a test going on between our grandchildren and our children. Uh, there's a test of our finances, and I can go on and on and on, all kinds of different tests that, that the, the tests affect. Now, each test, as I said this before, each test is absolutely necessary. That's what Peter's saying. Peter's saying that a test... The test that we go through, the test that, the enormous, oh, I'm sorry, the numerous tests that we go through, they are absolutely necessary. Peter tells us they are to strengthen our faith. They are to harden or solidify our faith. Now, when I use that word harden and solidify, I'm trying to say that they're to make our faith stronger. They're to, they're to make our faith pliable, durable. God wants strong faith. God wants our faith to be pliable, durable. Wants to be, and that's why he tests the area of faith, is to, is to strengthen it. Now, we also been talking about God using tests of, of, of our heart. And so God also, it's, it's important or it's necessary for God to test our heart because he's trying to soften our heart. He wants our heart to be receptive. He wants our heart to be open. He doesn't want, he doesn't want our heart to be hard in a sense of turning away from him. He wants our heart to be open and receptive, to be obedient. That's where God wants to bring us is obedience. Now, in Psalm 66, verse 10 and 11, it says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You have brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet, now listen to what he says, Yet you have brought us out to a place <laughs> of abundance. So, with every test, this is important. With every test, there's a beginning. Obviously, there's a beginning. There's a middle, and there is an end. Now, I know many of us sitting here this morning 
are going through this, are going through your own test. You've been going through it for a long time. It's an atomic bomb test, and you're thinking to yourself, will it ever end? Yes, it will. Because that's what God said in that verse I just read to you. God said, the, the, the writer said, he said, listen. He said, we have been going through all kinds of tests like silver is being tried in the furnace. We are going through all kinds of tests. He talks about all kinds of different tests that are occurring. Then he says, yet you bring us to a place of abundance. He's saying, listen, we're going to go through tests. There's going to be a beginning. There's going to be a middle. But I can assure you they're going to come to an end. <clears throat> and so when we are tested, God will. I didn't say God may. God will bring us back to a place of peace, of restoration, and renewal. The test is not going to be, it's not, it's not going to last forever. The test that you're going through today. The test that you're going through, maybe a new one's going to start tomorrow. It's just the beginning of one tomorrow. And it may last a week, it may last a month, it may last six months, it may last six years, but it's going to come to an end. Every test comes to an end. That's what the writer said in Psalm 66. He said, God will bring you back to a place of abundance, a place of peace, a place of renewal, a place of restoration. There can't be peace, renewal, and restoration when your mind and your body and your and your thoughts are all in a, in a bunch of a bunch of turmoil. There is no peace in that. It's very hard to find peace and restoration and renewal when you're being tested. And so God will bring us back. Now, James 1 verse 12 says, Blessed is the man, now listen to this, Blessed is the man who remains, what? Steadfast. Under what? Trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive what? The crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. All right. With every test we face, Peter's, I'm uh, sorry, James says we must remain immovable. We must overcome. We must persevere. Every test, regardless of, of, the, of the intensity, whether it's mild, severe, or atomic, whether it's, it's short, long, or extensive, or whether it's affecting your body or affecting your relationship with your spouse or your children, or even with God for that matter, it, you, we have to remain strong. We have to remain, uh, James is the word, steadfast. We have to remain steadfast. We have to stand the test. That means that we cannot be, we cannot be, uh, we have to be, we have to be immovable. We have to be, we have to be persevering. We have to overcome. Now, James talks about the grand finale. The grand finale is when it all comes to an end, when the test comes to an end forever, that grand finale, uh, James says that God has promised us the crown of life. That's a guarantee. A guarantee that, that in this world, I will go through tests. Beginning of one, the middle of one, and the end of one. And then another one's going to start, another one's going to go to the middle, and then it's going to end again. But ultimately, the grand finale, all the tests <coughs> come to an end. And I receive the crown of life. And you receive the crown of life. All right, today we're going to talk about that word, stood the test. That's what I want to encourage us today about. Because I want us to be encouraged what James said at the very end there. Two things I want us to encourage. Number one is what, uh, is what the writer said in Psalm 66. There's a beginning of a test, there's a middle of a test, and that test will come to an end. Maybe not tomorrow, maybe not Tuesday, maybe not a week from Tuesday or a month from Tuesday, but it will come to an end. God will bring you back to a place of peace, restoration, and renewal. The second thing I want you to, I want us to be encouraged is Paul tell or the writer James tells us that James says, listen, when it's all said and done, when that grand finale has occurred, and there is no more test. You're going to receive the greatest gift, the gift of eternal life, the crown of life. All right. Today I want to look at three people. Very quickly, I want to look at very, uh, three people. And I want, I, want us to, I want us to see their example and help us to be encouraged to follow that example. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, <coughs> Paul, Paul was speaking. He says, are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors. Far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. 
Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys and danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. And toil and hardship through many a sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And in verse 31, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I'm not lying. All right. We had said that very, the very first lesson we talked about how does God, how does God test us or how does, how does God allow Satan to test us? And Isaiah 48.10 says that God tests us or God allows us to be tested through the furnace of of affliction. And that can be bodily affliction, it can be emotional affliction, it can be a mental affliction, it's through the furnace of affliction. Now obviously, as we can see what, what Paul was sharing with us, Paul was sharing with us the furnace of affliction. He's sharing us with the tests that he has faced. Now, every one of these tests had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, Let's just real quickly just kind of summarize what, what uh, Paul shares with us. First of all, he tells us that he was whipped five times, 39 slashes. 39 lashes of a whip five times. Five separate times, 39 lashes of a whip. Three times he was beaten with a stick or with rods. Three times he was beaten with a rod. He was stoned once, left for dead. He was shipwrecked three times. One night and one day he was adrift at sea, hanging on to a raft, hanging on to a piece of wood from the boat that sunk. His life was often endangered by the Gentiles, as he said, by the Jews, as his own people, as he said, and by those false prophets, false teachers. He had spent countless nights unable to sleep, and I'm sure we've probably had countless nights we can't sleep. He's had nothing to eat and nothing to drink. He has, the, he has the constant stress and anxiety. He's exposed, he's been exposed to the elements, to the extreme heat and the bitter cold. And he says at the very end, he says, I know, God knows that I'm speaking the truth. I didn't make any of this up. And so Paul shares with us the, the, the events of his life, the tests that he has endured in his life. Now you notice that each test, as I said, had a beginning had a middle, and had an end. He was stoned one time, left for dead. That was a beginning, a middle, and there was an end to it. He was beaten with rods three times. Well, that wasn't three separate occasions. It wasn't, three, it wasn't once, and then twice, and then three times back to back to back. It was once, and then another test, back, so he was beaten again, and another test beaten again. So each test had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now, I want you to see what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when Paul is about to leave this world. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now, I want you to see what he says, and in, 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 uh, <clears throat> I missed it, sorry. So, he, he says that, Waiting for him, and I don't have that verse, and I missed it. He says, in that, in that next verse, he says, and waiting for me is the crown of life. So Paul, despite the test and its intensity or its duration or its effect upon him, Paul persevered, Paul overcame, and Paul remained immovable. <clears throat> and the Bible says in that verse that I don't have, he says that he stood the test, and waiting for him was the crown of life. So Paul, as he writes the letter to Timothy, he tells Timothy that he's being poured out as a drink offering. He's saying that I'm, I'm about to leave. I'm about to die. He knows that life is short. He knows that his duration on the earth is about over. He knows that he has reached the ultimate end. There'll be no more tests for him in his life. He's going to receive the ultimate prize, the crown of life. But while he was on this earth, and while he was going through all of those, 
those afflictions in the furnace, he had overcome each one. He had persevered through each one. And he had, he had, he had remained steadfast or immovable. He stood each and every test. How was he able to stand each and every test? Because he had, he had his, his, the Bible says in that verse, he said his faith was strengthened. He had steadfast faith. Now, I want us to go to, to another character. In, Job, in James chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Now, in, in the book of Job, uh, chapter 23, verse 10, Job says, But he knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. And so Job says that he knew that God was testing him. And he knew that he knew that with every test that God was allowing him to, to endure, he knew that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Because he says, when God has tested him, he will come forth, he will be brought out of that test as gold as it is refined in the furnace, or as it is tried in the furnace. So, so Job knew, as Paul knew, that each test has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And James tells us that Job was steadfast through all of his tests. And so, you know, we, we had a lesson on Job a few weeks ago where he lost his children. He lost his, his, uh, his family, his financial security. He lost his health. And yet, uh, despite, again, despite the intensity, despite the duration, despite the effect on Job and his family, Job persevered, Job overcame, and Job removed, remained immovable. The exact same thing that James, uh, that, said, that Peter tells us to do as we go through each test. Remain immovable persevere and to overcome. Now, so J so Job stood the test. James tells us he was steadfast. So he stood each and every test. And so waiting on him obviously was the crown of life. Because he says that. He says that when God has brought me to the test, I will come forth as gold. So he, he knew that as he would stood with each test, he was getting closer and closer to the closer to the ultimate end. The ultimate end when he receives the crown of life. All right. Lastly, I want to look at David. In Psalms 23, 6, David talks about steadfast faith. He talks about his his uh, he talks about his his standing the test. And Psalms 23, verse 6, he says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And notice what Peter uh, notice what Daniel, David says at the very end of that verse. And I shall dwell. I shall dwell. There's not a hint of doubt, a hint of, of, of apprehension. It's confidence. It's, it's, it's knowing full well. It's knowing it's certainty. I shall or I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, so now David, there's no way in the comments about David's steadfastness like James did with Job uh, in talking about his steadfastness. But, but Dan, David is talking about his own steadfastness about his own standing the test because he tells us that no matter what test he has went through, he had known, he knew that God's grace and God's mercy, goodness and mercy, was with him. It was with him every day, every step of that test. So David knew that there's a the beginning and there was a middle and there was an end of the test. And, I, and I, ultimately, at the end of those tests, was waiting on him the crown of life. Because he says, he says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the crown of life. I will be in God's heaven. I will make it. I will get through this. I know there's a beginning. I know there's a middle. And I know it's going to come to an end. And I know ultimately it's going to come to an end. And I will live with the Lord forever. And so I could have listed numerous, numerous, numerous things that happened to David's life. Obviously, one was Saul, Saul, Saul being so bent on, on killing David, of his jealousy of David. Losing his child, even though his child was, was out of wedlock with Bathsheba. Uh, God, God tested him because he, God took his child away from him. And then also, uh, Absalom's rebellion. Uh, Absalom was David's son, and, and Absalom wanted the kingdom. He wasn't going to wait for David to die, and so he took the kingdom from David. Uh, he, he, 
and he caused a rebellion and, and he took over the throne of, of, of Jerusalem and, and he kicked David and his family out. He said, there's the road, hit it. You're not, you don't belong here. You're not welcome here anymore. And so another, another very trying, a very testing time of David in his life. But yet, regardless of, of the intensity, the duration, or the effect that that test had on David, David persevered. David uh, overcame, and David was, uh, was immovable. He, he, was, he, was, he stood the test. Every test he took, he stood it. And waited on him was the crown of life, and he tells us. So, <clears throat> go back to 1 Peter, what 1 Peter says to us. He says, in this we rejoice. How in the world can we rejoice when we are being grieved by various trials? When we are going through test after test after test after test, how can we rejoice? Well, there's, three, there's two ways in which we find reasons to rejoice. Knowing first and foremost that the test that we're going through today is going to come to an end. It's not going to last permanently. It's going to come to an end. Now, unfortunately, there's another test coming. But that test will also come to an end. Every test comes to an end because God promises that he's going to bring us back to a place of abundance. A place of restoration, a place of peace, and a place of renewal. He promises that. So that test is going to come to an end. Also, ultimately, it's, it's also going to come to an ultimate end because he says that the testing genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you have not seen him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. Obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So ultimately, one day, ultimately, one day, God will turn every test into trial. Here on this earth, God will one day turn your earthly tests into triumph while you still live. Ultimately, one day, God will take all of your tests and turn them into triumph. There'll be no more tests. You have received the crown of life. So blessed is the man who remains steadfast. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, see, that's, that, that's important. God wants us to persevere. What did I say in the very beginning? I've been saying every lesson. What is the result of the test? When God examines us, what, is that, what results in God examining us? Does it pull us away from God? Does it bring us closer to God? Every instance that we looked at, it brought people closer to God. And that's where God wants us to be. Why? Because he tells us right here in James 1. He says he, says he wants us to stand the test. He wants us to receive what God has promised us. The crown of Steadfastness requires us to persevere. It requires us to overcome. It requires us to remain immovable. With every test we face, we must remain immovable. We must persevere. We must overcome. Because the grand finale, the, the, the test to end all tests, when it's over and said and done, we receive the crown of life. So I want to encourage you today. Many of you have been going through a long, hard, difficult test. Atomic test. That seemed to be no end to it. It will come to an end. God promised. He's going to bring us back to a place of peace. Of restoration. Of refreshment. Renewal. Ultimately. God's going to place upon your head.